Well, hello. Good afternoon to everybody who is joining us for how to take a both and approach to SEL and academics. We are so happy to have you here today, where we're going to have panelists discussing strategies for sustaining a connection between social and emotional and academic skill building in the classroom. Um, I'm Alexis Goldberg. I'm Managing Director of School Support at the Urban Assembly, and I'm really excited to be moderating this group of exceptional educators as we have this conversation today. Um, so I know many of you joined us earlier at our panel, and you heard our students make such a strong and compelling case for the connection between SEL and academics. Our students shared that relationships are the key foundation for how they learn and that communication and social skills are what enable them to be successful and navigating not only school, but the world that awaits them after graduation. So if SEL is to be not a moment, but a movement, we need to ensure we're able to address any lingering concerns that educators might have about how they use their resource and energy to support their students' social and emotional le learning and development, not in lieu of supporting their academic growth and long-term flourishing, but in service of it. So we have this phenomenal panel with us today to discuss just that. We're gonna meet them in one moment, but first I wanna make a quick note about the tech that we have here today. So please use the Q&A feature on the top right. You can ask questions privately and we'll protect time at the end to try to get to as many of them as we can. And I'd also love you to use the chat to introduce yourselves, to tell us a little bit about where you're from and what you do, what your role is. And please feel encouraged to use the chat um, to throughout the session to engage with us, to engage with each other. It helps us know that you're hearing what we're saying and that we're all communicating together. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers. So I'm going to start with Erica Faulkner. Can you wave, Erica? Um, Erica joins us from Chicago, where she is in the Office of Social and Emotional Learning, serving as an SEL specialist supporting the alternative high schools, as well as the SEL integration initiatives in Chicago public schools. And prior to working in the Office of Social and Emotional Learning, Erica served as an instructional support leader and a data strategist for CPS and was a classroom teacher woo, for 12 years in both Chicago and Houston. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Rodney Trice. Dr. Rodney Trice is the Chief Equity and Engagement Officer for the Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools. And prior to this position, he was Assistant Superintendent of Equity Affairs with the Wake County Public School System. Additionally, Dr. Trice has served as Executive Director for Curriculum Instruction and Technology, and later Associate Superintendent for Student and School Services and Equity Oversight with the Chapel Hill Carborough City Schools. Um, Dr. Janice Phelps. So Dr. Phelps is a director at the LA County Office of Education, working with 80 school districts and the 1.5 million students of Los Angeles County. Dr. Phelps is a champion for children, teachers, leaders, equity, and social and emotional learning. Prior to serving in this role, she worked in the LA Unified School District as a teacher, Title I coordinator, magnet coordinator, school site administrator, and district level leader. She's taught undergraduate and graduate courses at Pepperdine University, Cal State, the University of Northern Colorado, and Regis University. And she has a passion for teacher development and educational research. And finally, from our own New York City, Julie Mishadlishvili. Julie, if I got it wrong, you have to correct me. <laughs> um, and Julie is the Senior Director of SEL Integration at the New York City Department of Education. As an educator of 20 plus years, Julie began her career in education as a history instructor at Pace University and continued as a social, social studies teacher in high schools in Brooklyn and the Bronx. At Health Opportunities High School in the Bronx, she served as teacher, cohort coordinator, curriculum developer, assistant principal, and principal. So we have an amazing group of experts here today. And the very first question that I'm gonna pose to all of you is what does our SEL symposium theme, not a moment, <laughs> movement, to you and your work. And Erica, I'd love to start this one off with you. First, I am really honored to be on the panel. Um, amazing educators. Um, but I want to say that this particular question, I think so much about moments um, and the power behind a moment, right? Like moments are needed for there to be a movement. It is in these powerful moments, such as when Mamie Till took a stand against injustice for her son Emmett. Um, it is because of Rosa Parks moment on that bus. It is because of the everyday fight that we have in Chicago for our students' lives. It are, it's in these moments 
that we create movements. It is those powerful moments that lead to the movements. And I know that SEL may seem like this buzzword and everyone is talking about SEL, everyone's writing about SEL, but SEL came to us late 1960s. It was in the moment that Dr. James Comer saw a need to elevate and uplift black students who were living in poverty. He took that moment and through his research, through his work, um, inspired other educators, which leads us to where we are today. So I think about the fact that it has been a staple. We may not have explicitly called out SEL. We may not have explicitly given the language to our students, but there have been a collection of moments that have led to the movement. So I am proud to be a part of the movement to make sure our students, to make sure our families know that SEL is a powerful weapon. Thank you. Dr. Trice? Yeah, certainly for me, um, I think the theme speaks to the transformative position that we're in in education. Um, literally for the past 20 plus years, testing and accountability has driven a lot of the school improvement conversation, which is a, uh, an area that I work in. Um, and it's and don't get me wrong, I think there is a place for testing and accountability, but authentic school improvement starts in the classroom between the teacher, student, and tasks that we ask them to complete, not in the boardroom of testing agencies. And so the movement around SEL speaks to the promise we have before us um, to center effective uh, teaching and learning and to create more engaging and equitable classroom spaces, especially for at promise students. And I'm glad that Erica, you know, raised up the progenitors of the SEL movement. Um, in many ways, this is a return to and an extension of their work. And I have to highlight educators such as Asa Hillier, Geneva Gay, Gloria Lassen Billings, and others um, for advancing this work. We need to give them their flowers for this. So thank you. Uh, it's good to be here. Thank you. And Dr. Phelps? Well, and thank you again for uh, having me here all the way from the West Coast. And um, really, this theme to me speaks about longevity, right? This is not a one and done. Um, as Erica had mentioned, it has been years and years and years that social emotional learning and social emotional awareness um, has been in our schools. And it's essential to our students' development. As you know, with the pandemic, many of our students have experienced trauma. Um, I can tell you in Los Angeles County, with our 80 schools and over 300 charter schools, we have 1.5 million students. And out of those, 70% of our students, or about a million students, are socially disadvantaged. And we have like 160,000 students with disabilities. 63,000 of our students experience homelessness and 26,000 of them are foster youth. And so when we talk about social emotional learning and the need that we have in schools, it has to be a movement and it can't just be a moment in time. Um, you know, every day when I walk in the classrooms here in Los Angeles Unified, I see that there is such a need. Um, all of our schools are seeing that there is additional funding. So they are putting that funding into professional development, learning, um, hiring new people for uh, caseworkers, for social workers, for school psychologists, training teachers. Um, I can tell you when we came back from the pandemic, many of our teachers were just really craving additional skills and resources that they could use to be successful in the classroom with students. So I'm just very excited to be here today and talk about this very important subject. Thank you, Dr. Phelps. And Julie, same question to you. What does the theme not let a movement mean to you in your work? So definitely echo everything what my predecessors just said and very happy to be here. I'll uh, take it to uh, what it means for my work. I visited a school the other day and saw a growth mindset poster on the wall. So in my work with the leadership team at the school, I explained that having a poster is a moment but developing progressive grading policy based on mastery, giving students opportunity to revise work, providing students with actionable feedback. Instead of saying she's a brilliant student, as I observed during one teacher team meeting, saying that her skills of compar comparing and contrast are well-developed, but she still needs to grow her synthesis skills, are all the attributes of the growth mindset. 
So teachers' actions in every class and every day and school systems and structures, that's what promote growth mindset and not just a post on the wall. So for me, this is a movement that moves hearts, changes minds, and exists in education forever, at least for all the years that I've been in. So well said, and thank you to all of you for the really expansive way you view this theme. And I think, Julie, you actually led us perfectly into our next question, which really gets into the classroom. So great teaching often incorporates elements of SEL into classroom routines and academic lessons. So how do you think teachers can shift that more explicit to students, really raising it up? And then I'd love to hear an example of a time that you've seen this done well. And Julie, we'll start with you. We'll go in the reverse order this time. Thanks, Alexis. Uh, so as you said, social emotional development is just good teaching. We always remember those teachers who built relationship with us, helped us persevere, helped us feel that we belong, helped us in making decisions and just simply cared. We know that students need to manage their own learning, navigate interpersonal dynamics on diverse teams, engage each other in civil and productive debates, get comfortable and receive critiques on their reasoning and presentation styles. This is all part of a regular lesson plan, regardless if it's a plan for the circle time in the second grade or the physics lesson in 11th grade. Analyzing how and why individuals, events, ideas develop and interact over the course of text teaches students self-awareness and social awareness. Employing discussion techniques such as debates, Socratic seminars, philosophical chairs, develop relationship skills and decision making. Providing students with actionable feedback and chunking the material. Teaching students how to shift gears, trying a new strategy when the current one is not working, also develops optimistic thinking and goal-directed behavior. All of this can be achieved from the project-based learning, the strategy that is gaining uh, popularity across uh, the nation and teaches all of the social-emotional learning skills that we talked about today and prepare students for life after school, which is basically the goal of education in general. I see it all the times in uh, my visits to schools. I saw it last week in a project-based development um, in one of the school in Queens. When you were in New York City, we welcome you to see that in action. Great, same question to you, Dr. Phil. Oh, I think we need you to unmute. Good. All right. Sorry about that. I am just so excited. Um, also, like Julie, to be able to get into classrooms every single week um, where the magic happens, right? I am seeing teachers standing at the door, greeting students, doing their little secret handshakes, right? Making students feel welcome in the school environment. Morning meetings, closing circle. I see a lot of restorative practice where Students are learning healthy ways to be able to resolve some of that conflict. Um, I'm seeing social emotional learning embedded across content areas, across the curriculum, reading, writing, math, social studies, science, art, music, PE. I see it across the board. And to me, I feel like, OK, we are finally getting to where we need to be in the classroom. Um, one of the things that we did here in Los Angeles was we were able to uh, use an AB86 grant which offered funding for us to be able to do professional development for safe and welcoming schools, for social emotional wellness and mental health wellness as well. And it was a phenomenal turnout. We had presenters um, who were able to work not only with teachers and principals, but with school psychologists, with social workers, with any support staff in the school and to be able to provide training. We had uh, trainers from the um, Museum of Tolerance, you know, Dr. Malia, um, Alicia Majan, and Dr. Francis Gibson from Claremont University, um, Dr. Bear from UCLA. We had our very own David Adams and Brandon Frame come and do a session, and it was phenomenal about all learning is social and emotional. Um, we have departments of arts and culture where kids are actually learning 
skills through poetry and they are learning skills through dance and music. Um, it's really been a, like you said, a movement and a moment where we are able to provide these live webinars every month with supporting videos and study guides. And every teacher and support staff that has attended the training will receive a support pack of materials. So they learn the strategies, they see it, they can review the videos and live webinars, and they can actually implement it in their classrooms the next day. So we found that to be extremely successful out here in Los Angeles. Thank you, Dr. Trice. Oh, I think he's muted. You are muted. Dr. Trice, you're muted. Okay. I don't Perfect. know how that happened. <laughs> yeah, we're all figuring it out. Thank you, Bob. Well, let me start. <laughs> um, so I, I just think this is a fun uh, being more intentional about incorporating SEO competencies uh, into our rituals and routines, much like, you know, technology or real world experiences. Um, you know, I think that's basically what it is. I'll give you a quick example. So I'm working with a group of uh, math teachers to dismantle stereotype threat in the classroom. And for those that don't know, stereotype threat is the concept where students kind of internalize uh, stereotypes about their academic ability. In this case, we're focusing on math. And I'm sure you've heard students say, like, I'm not smart in math or I'm not a math student. Well, these are stereotypes usually around race and gender that students internalize and research suggests that uh, it greatly impacts academic performance. Well, SEL really is at the heart, at the center of our work around um, self-reflection. Part of our um, academic rituals and routines, we're asking students to be cognizant about their emotional reaction to lessons, assignments, the classroom environment, uh, at the same time examining their classrooms and uh, assignments for bias so, and, and exploring our identity. All of this is germane to having a healthy social and emotional learning environment. So as part of our core instruction, for instance, not, we don't only ask students to solve math problems. We have them put their math problems or write about their math problems in what we call their math notebooks, explaining um, their reasoning uh, for the ways that they approach the solving math. Uh, to incorporate like a SEL component to that, we're also asking students to express their emotion, emotional reaction, I should say, uh, to the task or to the lesson. So are there instances of anxiety or um, is there self-doubt kind of creeping in? And so these are small bits of information that I think teachers can use uh, to better connect with students, right? And what we're finding is that um, students' academic identity is increasing. Uh, it's just so helpful when teachers can help students navigate the content but also navigate the social and emotional response to the content and to each other, depending on how the classroom is structured. Thank you. And Erica, same question to you. Dr. Trice took my answer, um, but I am a former middle school math teacher. Um, and so something unique about, about what Dr. Trice was speaking about is that emotion, right? So as a middle school math teacher, I would often have the first thing when they walked into my classroom, the students would see this do now or bell ringer, whatever it's called for you, but solve this two-step equation or graph this line, graph this linear equation. And I had one student who I always think about who came into my classroom and immediately put her hoodie over her head and put her head down on her desk. And for her, this was stress. This was anxiety because of that identity threat, you know, like how she characterized herself, which was how her mother characterized her. But what we were doing is I was giving them the explicit standard, the explicit skill that they were going to solve or try to demonstrate, which was math related. What I did not do as an educator was give them the explicit SEL skills to help them through that anxiety or to help them face the challenge of those math problems. It was very implicit. 
right? Like I would talk to her, I would give her some techniques, but I wasn't giving her that language. I wasn't saying, you know what? This might not be the strength, but let's think about some of your other strengths. What are your other assets that you have? What are the things that you're bringing to the table? Now, if you can tell me that, look at how self-aware, like I didn't bring that in explicitly. So I think through our teaching practices, we have to give students the language. A lot of times as teachers, we hoard not only paper, but we hoard knowledge and we don't give students that language, right? It's like it's some secret, like if we tell them, oh, no, they're going to have more power than us. But we want that right so that they can transform communities. So through their self-reflections, through their self-assessments of their academic skill and their social emotional skills, we have to give them the language. They have to be able to talk to each other, give each other feedback that is explicit. Like my son tells me all the time and he's five. Mommy, we need to work on breathing first. You seem to be frustrated. So before breathe. And then tell me what you want me to do. So if my son is five, surely I should have gotten 13 and 14 year olds to be able to speak the language if I had only given it to them. So I will say in making it explicit, my key advice, give students the language right on the board. These are the skills, not just our math skills, not just our, you know, humanity skills. What are those social emotional skills that they are working on so that they can speak about what their strengths are? They can tell you their growth areas. They can tell each other their growth areas because they like to tell each other about themselves. Let it be productive. Let it be around social emotional learning. Thank you so much for that answer, Erica. I also have a six-year-old who tells me when I'm getting frustrated. So I uh, co-sign that, but I also really wanna raise up how much we heard about making the implicit explicit, uh, the routines and rituals and the ways in which the posters, the tools, the ways in which we bring it to the foreground. And I really uh, wanna underscore that point about how much language um, is power for, for our students. Um, and I, I'm gonna, write down somewhere that we uh, we hoard our knowledge as well as our paper. That was a powerful sound bite. Um, so another thing that we know is that um, SEL is a powerful tool for combating uh, inequality. And so one question to all of you is where in your work, in your SEL work, do you find the greatest opportunity to address inequity? And we'd like to hear you tell us a little bit about it. And Dr. Trace, we're going to start with you on this. Yes, I was just making sure that I wasn't muted again, <laughs> again. but um, I think as chief equity officer, I spend a lot of my time focused on, uh, with my colleagues, dismantling systems and structures that just serve to limit students, especially those um, based on social and cultural factors such as race, family, income, language proficiency, ability. Um, but what we're finding is that it's just not enough to dismantle inequitable systems. We have to be in the business of actually replacing those systems that create opportunity. Um, we have to ground those systems and our policies, our practices, and our beliefs in, in what students actually know and what students can actually do um, as a result of pedagogical moves by highly trained teachers. You know, so many inequities are rooted in uh, projections or averages, and they don't measure things like motivation, academic perseverance, you know, academic risk taking, these things that um, SEL enhances. And so building systems and policies that include these types of um, attributes, I think, presents the greatest opportunity in my mind. Thank you. Same question to you, Erica. I think um, one major part of my role is supporting our alternative high schools in the district. So we have a large population of students who may not have been by paper measure successful in their district high school, um, may have dropped out, they may have been involved in juvenile justice system, but somewhere along the way, they land in what we consider an alternative placement, right? And so oftentimes these students are farthest from the decision making. They are far, farthest from the resources. Um, and so we feel in some way that, or they feel that they are not deserving, right? Like my high school didn't fight for me. My parents may not have fought for me. And here I am. But just as Dr. Trice said, we have to teach them that there is beauty in your story. 
there is strength in your story. You are persevering because you are not dropping out. You are still in this place to receive an education. Social emotional learning is still happening. Like the responsible decisions that you're making. Um, I feel that a lot of times in big districts, like how we allocate resources sometimes is not towards the students who need it most. Um, so in this position, I am the person in the meetings that's constantly raising her hand. And now it's like with the little Google Meets hand. But what about our students that are in alternative placements? What are we doing for them? Um, I'm so glad that my role exists to support those schools, to be an advocate, to make sure that their voices are heard, um, and to make sure that they're getting everything that they need because they are valuable, right? And so I'm just going to close with that. Thank you. Julie, question to you. Thank you. I definitely echo what Eric and Dr. Trice said, and Dr. Trice stole my answer too today. Um, in my role, uh, I'm talking constantly about seamless integration of SEL into academics, but I also constantly remind myself when the first time I heard um, Dr. Zaretta Hammond talk about rigor about four or five years ago, and she said that to allow students to be more actively engaged and take ownership of their learning process, we need to invest into conditions of success and creating community where social, emotional, and cognitive conditions allow them to do that. Um, children are not going to succeed in school if the school is not safe, nurtured, if they're not known, if they're not challenged. And social, emotional development is just a, not just about the skills that students and adults possess and deploy. I mean, we can talk about adult SEL and what it means forever, but it's also about the educational setting in itself like it's all about culture and climate so that's where i see myself in the conversations with school leaders with district leaders in new york city about how integration of social emotional learning not as an add-on not as a just standalone but the things that exist from the moment the child walks into the school and being greeted by a safety agent and an assistant principal and by the time that the student leaves and gets on the bus all of that is part of the culture and climate and social emotional learning development so those are, it's the job of those adults to create that opportunity for students to be able to learn if that's not there they will not be able to learn on the level that we would love them to and i'll finish with that thank you and dr phelps the same question to you um, and I would echo the same things. I mean, our schools are a safe haven, right? Hub of our community. In many of our 80 districts, that's where our families go, our students for resources. And so really when we talk about equity work, um, our 80 districts are so diverse. We have districts, you know, all over Los Angeles County, and they all have different needs. And so really my work is to work with each of the individual districts, the individual schools, and see what is what is it that they need specifically? What are those needs um, that the school needs, the administrator needs, the family needs, the student needs? And so really with that much diversity, we provide something called DA, differentiated assistance, across the board to all of our schools. One of the benefits of being out here also in Los Angeles, like many of you on the East Coast and Midwest, is we have experts in the field that we look to, to work side by side with. And one of the experts that we're fortunate to work with here is um, Dr. Tyrone Howard from UCLA. And a lot of his experts equity work and just the work of getting students to thrive, not only in the school environment, but in, you know, outside of the school environment, in social settings, in the work setting. And so I can tell you that that's something that when we look at equity across the board, it really has to be specific to what those needs are to that community. And it's up to us to identify what those needs are and to be able to develop those action steps to be able to really implement amazing programs in all of our schools and districts. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Phelps. And to all of you, thank you so much. It's, it's so powerful to hear across all of these school districts, the different ways that you all are thinking about marshalling your resources, your connections, your communities, um, and really uh, putting equity at the center of your work. Before we dive into our next question, I just want to thank everybody in the audience for engaging so much in the chat and also remind you that if you do have questions for this group, we're going to have time at the end. So you're welcome to drop them in the Q&A function and we will be able to get to a few questions before the session is over. So with that, moving on to our next question, um, and this one is for Erica and Dr. Trice. Um, what would you say to educators that think that they have to choose between academics and social and emotional learning? Erica, do you want to start us off? I mean, you don't have to choose between the cream or the Oreo cookie. Um, you can really have them both. I mean, blow pops exist too. Think about that invention. Um, but seriously, um, I hear this a lot because teachers are like, one more thing. Goodness, you already have just introduced this new curriculum. Now what? What do we have to do? Um, I think research shows that, especially for our middle age students, like 14 and up, that standalone SEL curriculum is not as effective as integration. So when you're thinking about all of the ways that you are already engaging with students um, through academic discussions, through collaborative work structures, through having students do self-assessment and self-reflection, offering student voice, all of these things thrive in the classroom. All of these things also support SEL. So how are we making sure that we are, again, putting that through thread, making it explicit, so when students are engaging in that academic discussion, we are giving feedback such as, thank you for being very self-aware and owning that. Thank you for pointing out someone else's ideas. I really love how you are bringing the perspective of somebody else and lifting it. Um, thank you for adding on to that thought. That was very, you know, like really being explicit, not just around the content, but also around their SEL skills. So I'm just going to echo again, SEL explicit teaching um, can happen and you do not have to do anything extra. You don't have to buy any workbooks or any manuals or little puppets. You don't have to do that. Um, I think it is just how you bring it to students and then how you echo and then also provide that feedback to them, not doing anything extra. Thank you. Dr. Trace. Yes, I think um, Erica hit on it well. Like, I think it is a false choice in many ways. And I think it was Dr. Phelps who said, all teaching and learning is inherently social and emotional. You know, the question is, you know, to what degree do all students have access to positive and healthy social and emotional interactions in schools and classrooms? You know, we know at Promise students don't tend to have access to the most positive and healthy social and emotional uh, interactions. So as educators, we have a responsibility to build community. It doesn't cost a thing. We have a responsibility to foster self-reflection. That doesn't cost a thing. We have a responsibility to cultivate perseverance and promote connections across difference. You don't have to buy a workbook for that. You know, if we're truly interested in academic achievement, uh, particularly for at promise students, um, you have to take a both and approach because that's the only way that this thing this thing works. And, and now, you know, Erica has me wanting and craving Oreo cookies now, but I'll leave it there. I've been um, thinking of slogans for the t-shirts we're going to make after this. And it's uh, you can have the whole Oreo. And then on the other side, it's no puppets, no handbooks. <laughs> Sorry, that's our shirt for this panel. Um, so our next question is to Dr. Phelps and Julie. And so both of you work in some of the largest school districts in the country. What lessons learned from doing this work in the two largest districts in the country? And what is needed to ensure academic and social emotional skill building is taking place at every school when you're working in this scope? Um, Dr. Phelps, let's start with you. Okay. Well, as you know, um, next to New York City and Miami, we have Los Angeles Unified School District. And they, when I used to work in LA many, many years ago, uh, we had almost about almost 900,000 students. I think it's closer to a half a million now, but still a large amount of students, 500,000. And some of our smallest districts, like Gorman School District in LA County, has 74 students total. And so I think in my work, I really look at um, the diversity 
what that individual need is. Bottom line, and this is the biggest takeaway for me, teachers are the key, right? The people who are the closest to the students in the classroom, the um, administrators at the school site, we need to really, really invest on just really attracting and retaining quality educators in our field who really have a passion for students, for social emotional wellness, for you know mental well-being. I think that is the biggest key. One of the things that I do in my work is really investing in those teachers and administrators with that professional development and to have them be able to really understand not only the standards and not only the research behind it, but really practical and applicable tools, to, uh, practical and applicable skills so that they have the tools to be able to implement this in the classroom. I mean, you know, always be sure that everything we do, the student is at the center of everything that we do and that it is social, it is emotional, it is equity, and it is very inclusive. Um, you know, it's always interesting. People who know me know I wear a starfish around my neck, on my wrist, and you can notice a little starfish here in my office. And for those of you who know the starfish story, knows this is what kind of motivates us on a daily basis. And I'll give you the quick synopsis and you can always look up the starfish story. But one day this little boy was walking down the beach and there were millions and millions of starfish that washed up to shore after a storm. And he would pick up a starfish and throw it in the ocean and pick up a starfish and throw it in the ocean. And the elders were watching this boy walk down the beach and saw that there were millions and millions of starfish there. And one of the elders came up to the little boy and they said, son, what are you doing? You can't really think that you can make a difference. And the little boy looked at the elder. He looked down at the millions and millions of starfish on the beach. He picked one up. He threw it back in the ocean. And he said, I made a difference with that one. And that is just what constantly reminds me of the work and why we do what we do. I love that story. Thank you. Um, Julie, same question to you. So it's actually surreal listening to Dr. Faust because um, I observed the first grade teacher teaching that story a month ago in Brooklyn. So, I mean, that's just, I guess, summarizes everything that we've been doing here, how it's, we all speak the same language, even though we're in LA or New York City or in Miami. So my main priority is to change the mindset of educators towards understanding that academic standards are what students must learn and social emotional skills support how they learn it. Explaining that SEL is not an add-on, that there's no such thing as SEL period, but it only works when I do it explicitly. I think that's the word that's been used for the past 45 minutes the most, that we make decisions based on data. We develop strategic plans of integration and infusion of SEL into all aspects of school life. I usually start in a conversation with the um, with leaders about stressing that uh, Harvard uh, Education Magazine wrote that SEL is not a D2 from a pursuit of academics. To take this work on a citywide level uh, is what we learned uh, in the past years. It's important to norm what it means to do it well, build connections with other teams like academics, assessments, restorative practice, special education to show that we cannot do this work in silo. Find schools that do it okay, they do it well, and leave their practices to scale to the citywide level. Principals will not believe me, but they will believe their colleague down the road who has the same student population, but does this work with fidelity and beautifully. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks to all of you um, for these really thoughtful answers and for helping to illuminate so much about the way that really across our country, uh, different communities are, are really applying the same approaches and the same passion and the same rigor to integration of SEL and academics. So we have a couple of quick questions. I think we have time for one or two. Um, and the first one I think we 
we heard a little bit from in the last question, but I want to open it up to the whole group, which is we've heard a lot about sort of the specific integration on the classroom level and the routines and the procedures. I'd love to hear from all of you, what are tools that you use to, to do this work, the integration work of SEL and academics at the systems level? Whoever wants to jump in first. I guess I guess I can jump in for that one um, because you know I part of my work and really working with um, district superintendents, their executive team, um, teachers, you know, their chief academic officers, and you know, all levels, elementary, middle, high school. And one of the things is really starting with that mission and vision right? Where is it? Like, you have to find that North Star. You don't know where you're going and you can't develop a roadmap for implementation until you know where you're traveling to, right? When you get in a car from New York to LA, you just don't randomly get in your car and go, you know what, I'm just going to keep going west and eventually I'll find it. No, you have a very specific plan of where you're going, where you're stopping, how are you going to know you're making progress, where you're stopping to get gas because you're checking that fuel gauge, right? So it's really meeting with first the leaders in the district, finding that North Star, and then coming up with those steps and that action plan for implementation and really working side by side. This work is hard. It's not easy. It takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. And just really being there for that support, guidance, and providing resources so that they are able to reach that destination and that North Star. And can I can I jump in? I think um, Dr. Phelps. I think that's a you know it's absolutely uh, correct. It takes time, and it also um, takes at the system level um, belief and buy-in. And so it, sometimes it's easier to get buy-in at the you know the school level, the classroom level, because you're interacting with students and families and teachers. And at the district level, um, you know we're so ingrained into our district work that. We don't really understand SEL, the competencies, the way that our schools do. And it's not really integrated into our work uh, like it is at the school level. So we've been purposeful about learning just as much or investing just as much time as our schools are in terms of, you know, kind of understanding the competencies around self-regulation and self-reflection and interactions. And so um, if we're going to be a system or school system and not a system of, of, of schools, uh, we have to put in the work as district level uh, administrators uh, just as much as our school level administrators and teachers and students and parents. I'm nodding so hard at that. Um, and I love the notion that, right, the work has to start. If you're leading the work, you have to know the work intimately. Um, one more question to the group, and then I think we'll wrap up. Um, so there's a question about how we talk to families about this work. If families might be skeptical about the time or attention to social emotional learning, we know in some spaces there's a critical narrative around SEL. So if you face that, especially as a systems leader, how are you encountering and supporting schools to have that conversation? And I'll open that up to anyone who wants to answer. <sighs> So that was a lot of my work in the fall citywide, how to bring not just awareness to the families in New York City that social emotional learning is integrated into the work that schools are doing. Um, in general, first of all, any parent wants child to succeed, to so sending the message and building capacity of the schools to send the message that SEL skills are not just gonna help with academic achievement, but will help the student to be um, productive citizens of society and succeed after school. And that's basically what any parent and in the relationships with the loved ones will help. Uh, bringing to uh, some history without maybe naming it explicitly that uh, as somebody mentioned earlier, maybe SEL as a term is relatively new, but we've been talking about emotional intelligence and character traits and just each of us remembers that teacher who builds relationships and helps them make decisions. So bring invoking that in parents and also helping schools not just increase parental engagement, but parental empowerment, like Dr. Map talks about all the times, like we parents need to understand that they make decisions together, they're partners 
in this work that it takes it takes a village to raise a child and um no this is not just a um program that are being brought in instead of physics but this being done explicitly and it will support later on for child to succeed in college in work i, I know it's last, yeah. last 19 seconds so I'm sorry. Gonna, yes. i'm gonna wrap you there no it's so powerful and i would just want to say that this whole conversation with everyone here has been really powerful um and i'm so grateful to all of you for lending your expertise to this conversation today and i'm so grateful to the audience for engaging with us um please press join to enter your next session